Welcome to the Jimmy Lloyd Songwriter Showcase. I'm your host, Jimmy Lloyd. On this episode, we have three more great artists for you. Two up-and-comers and one that's already over the hump. The first is an easy-on-the-eye songstress, originally from Ottawa, Canada, named Claire Riley Rowe. Then we have Elephant Goes West, featuring John Buscema and Eric Birchfield. Lastly, we have Southern Rock aficionados, the Sheepdogs, who won last year's Rolling Stone cover contest and are currently signed to Atlantic Records. Stay tuned. Here with Claire Riley Rowe on the New Jersey waterfront. Oh, so many cameras. Huh? There's so many cameras. So yes, Claire, that's how we shoot interviews with cameras. Uh, let's uh, let's try this again. Here with Claire Riley Rowe on the New Jersey waterfront. Uh, Claire, are we safe around here? Are we safe? Or could we get mugged? No, we'll we'll be fine. Uh, I assure you. people. I don't know. Um, can we get through this? Okay. 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 Let's go. Uh, Claire, it's great to have you here today. I thought this setting would be particularly appropriate. We have a wonderful view of the Statue of Liberty back there. Um, now, you're originally from Canada, and you made the big move to New York. Uh, how long have you been down here? About six years. And did you just come cold turkey? Well, it's funny. A few times my mom used to uh, smuggle me over the border. Smuggle you across the border, like, like you were in the trunk, like you're crossing Checkpoint Charlie? Pretty much, yeah. We would drive across, and we would tell them that we were going outlet shopping. Okay, and then at a certain point, you made the big move. Now now that you've been down here, are you just kind of surviving on your, your wits in songwriting? I'm going to have to uh, skip to the next question on that one. <laughs> okay, all kidding aside. You're obviously uh, a very serious songwriter. I've seen you perform many times. You're rather well known here in the New York area. What have been some of your biggest influences? Well, growing up, my mom used to blast Carole King. Literally like 49 times a day she would play, I feel the earth move under my feet. That was Carole King? <laughs> Tapestry, get that album. Anyway, she's one of the best songwriters, so it was just amazing to listen to that. I definitely sense a strong kind of 70s vibe in what you're doing. Um, if you had a time machine and you could travel back in time, but you run the risk of never coming back to the present, where would you go? Um, I would go... I would go back to the 70s and I would be Tom Petty. You'd be Tom Petty? Yeah. You know, come to think of it, you, you do kind of resemble a female Tom Petty. Have you ever gotten that before? <laughs> yeah, I have, actually. You're not Tom Petty's, like, love child, are you? I, I might be. My parents were also hippies, so they drove around in, in a VW bus in Mexico in the 70s, late 70s, so never know. Does your mom talk about Tom Petty and then just kind of, like, end the conversation quickly sometimes? No, she was more a John Denver groupie. No. Okay. <laughs> so when it comes to lyric writing, uh, do you struggle with that or do words just tend to come easy for you? Words flow. Um, they, they come out pretty easily. Sometimes even when I'm on the go, I'll, uh, I'll record a, a little voice note into my iPhone if I don't have time to work out the song from beginning to end and it comes out in cheerleading form. Which cheerleading is, form? It, you just chant it out and so there's no melody so it's like you and me like wine and cheese together we only get better. Lovely. Were you a cheerleader? No, we didn't even have a football team. How else do you write lyrics? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't only write lyrics like that. Um, like I said, I like to observe and see life happen in front of me. Uh, I'm lucky to have girlfriends with a lot of dysfunctional relationships, so I get to take from that. Sometimes I get text messages and put them right into a song. You'll take your friend's text messages and, and put them into your song? Absolutely, yeah. Well, you might run into some publishing issues down the road, don't you think? I'm lawyered up. I'm good. Okay, you're good with that. Now, you recently released your debut CD, Island in the City, and how's that been going for you? It's been cool. It was great to record. I worked with uh, producer Tony Black on it. The feedback's been awesome. Girls tell me they like to make out to it. Guys say that it's good for driving, and they're happy their girls want to make out, so everyone's happy. Now, I've seen the video for this song, and it looks like you particularly enjoy uh, driving the director crazy in this video. Yeah, art imitates life. I definitely drove the director, the real life director, Carter B. Smith, crazy. I think I can, I think I could relate to that. What was what was the premise supposed to be? <laughs> well, we didn't have a premise for a while. Uh, we had a date set to shoot. Um, Carter is this awesome New York City glamorous director that only shoots rock stars and supermodels. 
and literally me driving him crazy over the course of the week of planning it, uh, I came up with this idea of let's have this director character who was played by actor Jeremy Sisto. Great to have him in the video. He was so angry and so funny. Very, very funny guy. What was the primary issue? Well, you know, it's it's like living in New York. Um, New York is a really fast-paced city, and and uh, pretty girls around here have to kind of show that. The whole idea was he was trying to get me to be glamorous and naked, and and I just wanted to play music and get high with the band. So he didn't really respect you for your your artistic integrity. Exactly. Well, I I hope. I hope we're doing a better job of that today, and uh, it's been really great having you here. I really wish you uh, all the best of luck. Uh, you're a lot of fun to be around, and um, looking forward to seeing you play play live soon. Thanks, I really appreciate it. Here with Eric Birchfield and John Buscema from the New Jersey band Elephant Goes West. Uh, fellas, it's uh, great to have you here today. Uh, thanks for having us, Jimmy. Glad to be here. Uh, we have this lovely park bench in this nondescript location here in New York City. Wanted to give you guys a chance to introduce yourselves to our fine audience. How come we aren't in the uh, studio with the lights and the fancy equipment? Well, the studio, it's actually it's being renovated this week. I had a friend who was in there like two days ago and she said it was fine. Dude, your, your friend is lying to you, bro. This is as good as it's going to get. <laughs> Anyway, I uh, came across you guys late last year, pretty much by accident, walked into one of your shows in Brooklyn, and I was struck by two things, uh, your phenomenal musicianship and the undeniable influence of Paul McCartney that I heard in your songwriting. Were you guys like born under the recording console in, in Abbey Road Studios or something? Yeah, well, I, I might have been born there. I know I was conceived there. <laughs> Am I wrong, though, in hearing this strong McCartney influence in your songs? Not at all. Uh, the Beatles are will always be my favorite band, and my favorite Beatle will always be Paul, the cute one. And uh, uh, they're probably my foremost biggest influence in my songwriting, would be Paul McCartney. Does that go for you as well? The Beatles, they're kind of like the Bible of making music, and Paul's kind of like Jesus. Now, when it comes to songwriting, do you guys collaborate Lennon and McCartney style on all of your songs? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes a uh, song will be... 50-50 split right down the middle of collaboration. Sometimes I'll come to John with a song that's you know 95% of the way there, and I just need John to t tighten it up. And, uh, and and do you focus more on the music and John the lyrics, or how does how does your songwriting process itself work? I'm uh, I'm a melody guy, and that doesn't necessarily mean lyrics, but I'm hearing the voice section, the vocal part. John is an arranger. John, I'll it'll be a skeleton of a song, and I'll take it to John. And, give it its meat. do a lot of the production work, um, getting the sounds, figuring out what direction to take a song in and how to establish the groove and, you know, make it sit right. I've been in the studio with you. Uh, what are some of the, the techniques that you use <laughs> to make some bizarre sounds? Uh, one time we had a washing machine that we hit with a mallet. The neighbors enjoyed that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, beer bottles with bottle caps in it. Um, you know, a producer shouldn't give away his secrets. Now, I know you guys love to overdub. Uh, what's the uh, Guinness record uh, for you guys in terms of the number of overdubs you put on a you put on one song? I'm not sure. Um, we can get up to like 80 to 100 tracks yeah. on any given. A bit obsessive compulsive, don't you think? Yeah. yeah. In the past, you've said that your music comes first and then your lyrics. Uh, how did you actually describe that to me the first time we talked about it? Um, so you have a song, and it's a finished song except for the lyrics. You sit around and you play it, and you speak in tongues, practically, until something sits right. So it's just total gobbledygook. Yeah, absolutely, Dr. Seuss. But when the words finally do come, do you find that they have particular meaning to you, or is it just what sounds good, what what no. fits the, the melody? No, it, they do have <laughs> meaning. It's, it's all from the subconscious. Uh, you know, I'll be spouting nonsense until this turn of phrase that I can write 25 pages about if I wanted to pops out and... That's that's how I write. What do you like to write about? Um, drunks. Drunks. Yeah. Uh, being drunk or being around drunks? Both. Both. Uh, big fan of Charles Bukowski. You know, the famous drunk author. I love drunk authors, so I like writing about drunks. Be it desperate drunks or happy drunks or love it. That's what and, I write about. And John, you share this uh, this pastime? Uh, I don't do a lot of lyric writing myself. But you do a lot of drinking. Eh. As much as the next guy. Yeah. 
Okay. Now, you guys also have an alter ego. Elephant Goes West uh, itself is your primary band, but you go by another name as well, the, the Keepers of Stilltown. What's, what's that about? Yeah, uh, we're in the Keepers of Stilltown, which uh, we're the backing band for this enigma wrapped in a mystery, wrapped, wrapped in pork roll called uh, <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy Lloyd. You guys play with Jimmy Lloyd. The one and yeah. only Jimmy Lloyd, yeah. We're, we're pretty lucky. <laughs> I mean, I've heard of him, but I can't say I've ever known anybody who's gotten that close to him. What, what's, what's he really like? It's dangerous. You never know. Uh, you don't want to turn your back to him. He might hit you in the back of the head with a blunt object or something. <laughs> He's got a lot of pressure. He's got a lot on yes. his plate right now. Yes, very famous. Very famous and yeah. shady individual. Well, I think you guys have a really wonderful future ahead of you. I consider myself really lucky to, to know you as friends and also as fellow bandmates, and I just wish you the absolute, the absolute best of luck. Oh, thank you, Jimmy. Thanks, Jimmy. So sweet. Such a gentleman. Scholar, songwriter, lyricist, poet. Very cut. <laughs> luxuriously appointed green room of the Mercury Lounge in New York City with 50% uh, of the human resources that make up the Sheepdogs, uh, Ewan Curry and Ryan Gullen. Uh, fellas, uh, thanks for being with us today. Thanks Hello. for having us. Now, you're in the middle of a pretty substantial tour. How's that been going? And uh, how many cities are you hitting on this tour? Um, it's not really like a linear, like one after the other tour. It's just sort of like living out of a suitcase. So it goes on forever. Uh, and there's an infinite number of cities. What have been some of the uh, recent high points? Um, you know, we went over to the UK and Europe for the first time. We played at Coachella. Um, Australia. Australia. Yeah, we toured with John Fogarty in Australia. And yeah, it's been great. Now, you guys are originally from Saskatoon, which, from what I understand, is somewhere in Canada. And I like to pride myself on the intelligence of our audience, but for those who may not know where Saskatoon is, where exactly is it? Let's say this is Trenton, and this is Montana. Where's Saskatoon in relation to this? Right above, like yeah. your map. I think it's sort of like about here. Right uh, above Montana, right above North here. Dakota. Okay, so Trenton doesn't help at all in terms. Trenton, of <laughs> it's a little bit. You know, you'd have to really. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm thinking in Google Maps, but I can't explain it. Okay. <laughs> well, for your audience who may not know, it's the capital of the fine state of New Jersey. Little little trivia there. Um, the obvious question is, for four guys from so far north, how did you come to make such great southern rock music? Uh, I don't know. I don't feel like you have to necessarily play, you know, musically what has historically come from your part of the world, you know. We live in, like, an age where you can go on the internet and find absolutely anything, so you don't, you're not necessarily limited to just what's physically around you, so we just playing the music that we like and it just so happens to sort of resemble music from other regions I guess. Yeah, I mean I listen to you fellas and I hear you know the Allman Brothers and the Black Crows and Skinner of course were these big influences uh, on you growing up? Some of those yeah like definitely the Allman Brothers but I mean even like more I mean people play up the southern rock thing but there's a lot of just regular rock and, and even sort of old school pop influence that we enjoy just good music you know. Now Ewan are you the primary songwriter for the band? Yes. And uh, how does your songwriting process work? Um, usually I come up with something, you know, a song idea, uh, whether it's just sort of a riff or maybe a more sort of fully fleshed out song. I just come up with that on my own and then I'll get together with the guys and we'll sort of start to hammer it out and get its final shape. And, yeah. and are you primarily a rhythm guitarist or a lead guitarist? Because I know that you certainly got the chops to play lead and I see you sometimes trading licks with uh, right. Liot. Yeah, it's sort of, I mean, I play a lot of rhythm, but I do play some leads too. It might be like kind of a 60-40 a lead, 60-40% um, lead sometimes. I play a lot of the licks, but yeah, it, it's not real like any set positions that we have to follow, you know. Mm -hmm. That's all. It's, it's pretty loose. And Ryan, how long does it take you to, you know, find the groove in, in his songs and, and really put a nice bass line to it? Usually, I mean, a lot of our songs are derived, you know, in a jam kind of setting and then 
you know, our last album, Learn and Burn, spent a lot of time just kind of figuring things out and actually just recording it ourselves. So I would try different things, try different stuff. And sometimes you just come and say, like, I like this, play this. <laughs> do you go with your gut a lot or do you spend a lot of time like overthinking, uh, you know, what you've done? the bass players that I look up to or that I appreciate are, you know, busier and, um, you know, add something to the song as opposed to just being like a strict, like backbone kind of thing. So I like to kind of listen to what the guitars are doing, what the drums are doing and kind of fit somewhere in between there. Um, I, I maybe overthink it in the sense that I try to be as interesting as I can be, because that's what I really appreciate, you know, guys like Paul McCartney and people like that who, you know, their, their, their bass lines really make sometimes make the song or at least make it a lot more interesting well I, I had the privilege of seeing you guys at south by southwest a few months ago and just the way it worked out i found myself standing in front of the bass amp and every time you hit a string on that rickenbacker of yours it just felt like a, a cavalcade in my chest now were you doing this on purpose i don't even think it was much of a, a very big amp in that in that <laughs> sense but uh yes i was doing it on purpose a really big sound i think that's what happens when you stand in front of the bass amp you want to try and just stand a little more yeah, side. Lesson learned there. Yeah. Now, I, like many other people, uh, came to learn about the Sheepdogs one day last year when my Rolling Stone magazine arrived in the mail and I saw you fellas on the cover and I was like, who are these guys? How drastically did your life change, like the day before and the day after that cover came out? Um, well, to be honest, it was more gradual build than, you know, the overnight thing that people often think, I think. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, both within and outside of the whole Rolling Stone thing. I mean, it was a long process. It's like the whole competition thing started. And so we found out in December and the cover came out the beginning of August. So, so you had time to prepare for uh, the media avalanche that was going to be coming. I think the preparation was us spending seven years before that yeah. touring around in a crappy van and not making any money right. or getting anything. So, you know, we kind of worked out all the interpersonal things and, you know, ready to ready to be a band. We're not still trying to iron out like who we are as a band or who we are as people yeah but I think that any of the rise and exposure that came from that meant that we could start you know playing music full-time not having jobs things like that but obviously there's so much work to be done I mean that's why we're constantly touring and making a new album and you know recording and all that kind of stuff is because we want to keep like building on that you can't just be on the cover of Rolling Stone and then just kind of call it a day and just sit back and expect money to start rolling in. You've, you've bucked a lot of trends over the years. Um, did you ever deviate from the type of music that you write or was it always this kind of classic rock uh, sound that you've uh, that you've written? Um, no, I think it's always been sort of the, the same style just because, you know, it's always been a, we weren't really listening to bands of the day. I know I was and I was listening to old music because I like the melodies and, the, you know, guitar tones and all those kinds of things. And so just basically trying to uh, play music like my heroes, I guess. Right. I think the harmonies really make the Sheepdogs stand out a lot. Uh, was, did that just happen naturally, or were you like, hey guys, you know, uh, sing on this? I think it was a slower process. When we started off, we were very, like, I'd sing, we'd play really sort of caveman, like, crappy songs, and uh, and then as we started, you know, to get more accomplished, the, the riffs got better, and then, you know, I think these guys were eager to, and I encouraged them to sort of start singing, and, you know, we put together... I don't know, we, we like really got into like a phase where we're really listening to like Crosby, Stills, and Nash all the time, um, which is, I think every kid goes through, right? Like, <laughs> oh, sure, sure. The CSNY it's also, phase. It's also one of those things, I mean, all the band, a lot of the bands we like sing in harmony, and that bands that we liked, whether old or new, we really enjoyed, you know, it's part of, you know, it enhances the melody and things like that. and. And I think we decided we worked at, I mean, we have a horrible PA at our jam space. And so we got really good at singing, not really being able to hear ourselves. And I think that in some ways helped. I think another thing that the, the tight harmonies do is really convey that sense that you guys are a band, that it's not just you with some hired guns behind you. And I mean, that camaraderie really, really comes through. Whether or not the listener is aware of what's going on, you definitely get that sense of unity. Um, how long have you guys known each other as friends and as bandmates? Um, I don't know. Ryan and I went to high school together, but we weren't really friends until grade 12. Um, we knew Sam kind of from high school, same time. And then Lee, we met actually years later. He kind of joined the band a little after us. But, you know, I was thinking about the last thing you said about the harmony thing. I, I said Crosby, Stills, and Nash, but I think it's more like Sly and the Family Stone. Like, there was a period where I was really into that band. And I like, you know, they called themselves a family. Everybody sang. Everyone played a really good instrument. I like the 
a band where the guys are not only good, you know, not only good at their instrument, but can sing as well. You know, the band. Uh, yeah. You know, there's a million examples. But yeah, it's that, like a, a call and response uh, quality, and it really is. You know, uh, I think like a like a family vibe. Absolutely. You touch on response, and also like we we try to feature in some of our songs, but also like you know, even like that's the best part of the Grateful Dead to me. You know, not the long jams, but the that sort of tightness, that sort of family kind of like brotherly bond that they have, and it just kind of makes the you know, music more sort of positive and makes you feel better. Yeah, it also but, makes it more genuine, I think. Yeah, well. I recognize that when we had uh, a few minutes to talk uh, down in South by, I left and I thought, what, what genuine guys? I mean, when you think about the the level of opportunity that is before you and like everything that's going on as a result of the uh, the Rolling Stone cover and everything it's led to with Atlantic Records and all you guys really could be carrying yourselves in a much different manner, but I, I was definitely struck by how just open and honest and, and nice you were uh, when we met after your show. We are Canadian. We're, yeah. we're secret assholes. <laughs> That's what we are. Also comes from, you know, coming up and seeing the way that people that thought they were they were big acted towards us, and I don't think we ever want to emulate some of those people we met over the years yeah. as well. Now, having paid your dues and knowing what you wanted all along and, and as you're getting closer to it, um, is it different than how you thought it might have been, or is it unfolding exactly how you kind of thought it would be? Uh, you know, I don't think we knew, you know, what we are getting into when we you know started this competition and everything I don't there's no sort of prerequisite for it it was the first time it ever been done and it's uh, you know it's certainly a, a unique experience yeah I think that obviously we were at a point where we really wanted to like make something happen and so we weren't I guess necessarily sure but obviously like you know getting to know what it's like to be on the road non-stop living out of a suitcase maybe not exactly what we expected but it's what we want to be doing. We want to be playing music to people. I think that was probably, you know, the biggest life change is, you know, you, you always want to be like, I want to be full-time musician. I want to be on the road just making music. And then you realize it's a lot more on the road and a lot less. Yeah, be careful what you wish for. You realize being on the road sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine you're probably starting to get access to people you never thought you might ever meet. Have you found yourself in these situations in a room with like maybe an idol or somebody you thought like, oh my God, I can't believe that's him standing right there. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, there's some, you know, opening for Fogarty obviously is pretty huge because I can remember being a little kid and listening to it, wearing out like a Credence tape and, you know, Kareem Abdul Jabbar is a strange guy to see in person. Was that one of your shows? No, <laughs> he, he probably he would hate our music, but. Uh, <laughs> How did the, I want to hear this story. How did that happen? No, nah, he was at Bonnaroo last summer promoting his movie or something, and so he happened to be there, so I. I hassled him for a photo because I'm a big basketball fan. But. Is it a kung fu movie or a basketball movie? Um, I think it's a documentary, yeah. So did you just like approach him like cautiously or? I, I was like, hey, can I give you my demo? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I just asked him. Now you're in the studio currently working on your new album? It's all done, actually. It's all done. Yeah, we, which is actually another person that we got you know, access to is we ended up working with Pat Carney from the Black Keys. I mean, starting as a band and, you know, really enjoying the music from kind of the beginning of our band. It was pretty cool to be able to, you know, work with him, become friends with him and have him produce our record. Were all your songs written when you went into the studio or did you just work them out right there? Uh, they were written, but they were in sort of various stages of completion. Um, you know, there's a lot of shaping that went on, in, you know, on the fly. And that's kind of the whole theme is that the whole record was really made, in, you know, on the run because we basically toured all of last year, had a little bit of time off in January to make the album and then we were out of there. And what's it going to be called? Uh, it's going to be called Sergeant Pepper's... No, it's we don't have... Uh, it's vaguely familiar. It's a secret name that I can't divulge. Okay. Meaning, well, meaning that it's going to be self-titled. <laughs> <laughs> How about Sheepdog's Graffiti? Led Zeppelin. How about In Through the oh, Dog Door? There, you might be onto something here. <laughs> Do any of your... Of the holy. Yeah. <laughs> Do any of your amps go to 11? Uh, no, but mine goes to... Uh, Usually just about six or seven. Have you guys had any Spinal Tap moments uh, throughout this uh, yeah. recent experience? Every, literally every time we like walk through the hallway to find the stage and we can't find it for a second, we like ref reference that Spinal Tap. So we've made that joke a lot of times because there has <laughs> yeah. been times where we literally didn't know where we were going. That and uh, once I had a cucumber and tinfoil in my pants. <laughs> Speaking of where you're going, where do you guys think you're going? Where do you want to be a year, two years, five years from now? Uh, you know, hopefully hobnobbing with Bono and, you know, hanging out with Nelson Mandela. And, I, don't know. I hear Bono never picks up the bill at a bar. So. 
uh, then I'm, not, I'm out. Not someone we should be hanging out. Yeah. I'm out. I don't have any money, so. Yeah. Well, it's been really awesome spending some time with you guys. I know you got to get up to your sound check, and I really appreciate you taking time uh, out of the tour to uh, be on our show. Wish you the best of luck, and I just really am looking forward to the new album. Great. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you. What makes a great song? It's a chant, an anthem, a sense that there's something more out there. It's a feeling deep down in your bones that something just isn't right and that something's got to give. Maybe you were the smartest in the class and you used to get credit for just showing up, and maybe you were voted most likely to succeed. But then you hit 25 and you realize maybe you peaked too soon and life didn't really pan out for you the way you expected it to. But maybe you also happen to write great songs. If so, we want to hear from you. Send a link to your music to Songwriter Showcase at JimmyLloyd.tv. If we think you have what it takes, then maybe you can appear here on the Jimmy Lloyd Songwriter Showcase.